Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Grand Rounds, and thank you for bearing with us while we work through some minor technical difficulties. Hopefully, everybody can see and hear us today. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Cynthia Morrow, MD, MPH. She's the health director for the Roanoke City and Allegheny Health Districts. She also serves as the domain director for health system sciences and interprofessional practice at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. Prior to moving to Roanoke in 2017, she serves with the Commissioner of Health for Onondaga, Onondaga <laughs> County, New York, and the Learner Chair for Public Health Promotion at the Maxwell School, Syracuse University. She has co-authored and co-edited five public health textbooks. Dr. Morrow earned a bachelor's degree from Swarthmore College and a combined MD-MPH from Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cynthia Morrow. So, so what Vivian didn't share is that we met each other learning to play, well, playing tennis. I'm not good at all. Like, I'm a terrible, terrible tennis player. Um, so, what we're going to talk about, what, what Dr. Premershwar asked me to talk about was just public health, public health system. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, so what we're going to do today is, uh, sure, absolutely, um, is to, I want to make sure we're all on the same page, and certainly um, folks online, feel free to um, join in, in the chat, but to define health and, and public health, make sure we're all on the same page. Talk about the government organization of, of health and public health, really with an emphasis on, on public health, and then talk about the intersection of the healthcare delivery system and public health. So the way that we're going to do that is to, I'm going to try to make this interactive. I know it's early in the morning, so that might not be successful. That's okay. Really looking for folks on, on the um, virtual world to, to join in. Review government's role in public health um, and really talk through what we at the Roanoke City Allegheny Health Districts have to offer. Um, at the end of the day, we're partners in improving our community's health. So, what does health mean to you guys? How do you define health? I think um, lack of illness. Lack of illness. State of well-being. State of well-being. So a lot of us, I think, think of lack of illness. WHO, state of well-being, physical, mental, and social well-being. And so if we think about health as this really broad perspective on well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And we are definitely trained to think about absence of infirmity. Like, that's that's the way we go through our med ed. Um, oh, and wow, that's really fuzzy. Sorry about that. Um, if you think about that definition, the World Health Organization's definition, it's kind of daunting if you're responsible for the social, mental, and physical well-being of the patients that you serve, right? What is public health? How, how we structure society so that people can avoid illness and have as healthy a well-being physically, mentally, and socially as possible. So how we structure society to help people achieve well-being, basically, right? Other ideas about public health? Moving beyond the individual health and to more of a, almost like a policy or how we keep the whole area healthy. Moving beyond the individuals, looking at how policies influence health. Um, yeah, taking care of the, the, the community, not the, in, well, the individuals and the community. And this is all going to come, come full circle. Um, so there are two main definitions that I typically use, um, the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health, using that very broad definition of health. And the critical thing here is through the organized efforts of society, so what society does exactly. And it is the community, it's not just the individuals. The National Academies of Medicine, Institute of Medicine, 
talks about what collectively we do as society to assure conditions. And so when we think about assuring conditions, and these are the 10 essential services um, of what public health does, um, so the three core functions of public health are assessment policy development um, and assurance, and then there are subsets of, of those within, within the 10 essential services. And this was changed in 2020 um, to focus on health equity being the center of everything that we do. So everything that we do is driven by the goal of achieving health equity in, in our communities. And that's where the community, looking at individuals and how they how they fit into their communities. Um, so when you think about assuring the conditions in which people can be healthy, what must we have in order to be healthy? Public sanitation. Clean water, clean water, clean water, right? So we have to have public sanitation. If we think about life expectancy gains, how much life expectancy gain did we get in the, in the 20th century, 1900 to 2000? 20 years. 20 years? 30. 30 years. And of those, how many are attributable to public health interventions, knowing that public health and healthcare delivery intersect continuously? Any idea of how many of those years are attributable to public health? 95%. <laughs> 25. Not, not quite 95. But if we think about the greatest increase in life expectancy, the greatest increase in life expectancy was between 1910 and 1920, sanitation, 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 and refrigeration. So, so our infectious diseases plummeted um, as we were able to, um, to, to have safer water. So safe water, what else must we have? Health, healthy, safe food. So we in public health don't address the healthiness of food in general. ACA required and calorie labeling, but as a, but we do assure the safety of food. So we'll, we'll we'll get back into that in a minute. Um, so clean water, safe food. Safe environment. <laughs> Safe environment, clean air, right? So, so indoor, indoor um, air act, making sure that we don't have tobacco in, in places. So those are, are like the basic things. But there are a lot of other conditions in which um, we, we need to, so social, so socioecologic model, probably everybody in this room is really familiar with the socioecologic model. <laughs> There are individual factors, there are interpersonal factors, there are organizational factors, and there, there are community factors, um, <coughs> all of which are shaped by policy, all of which are shaped by law. So public health tries to look at all of these factors. Now we can't, that's a tall order, right? Like we can't do everything, but, but theoretically our <coughs> job is to assure all of these conditions in which people can be healthy. Um, now, there are different ways of looking at social determinants of health. Um, I know we've talked a lot about social determinants of health. One thing, no matter where you live in the United States, you can look at the county health rankings for your state, and you can find out within your state where your county ranks. Um, Sean and I were talking about the Sean is a medical student who's doing a policy elective with us um, at the health department. We were talking yesterday that there are limitations to the county health rankings. It's a zero-sum game. Someone has to be number one, and someone in Virginia has to be 133. There's, we can't all be one, so it is a zero-sum game. But it is a framework that you can use, no matter where you are, to look at the health of the community in which you're, look, you're, you're living. And it breaks down social determinants of health into health behaviors, clinical care, socioeconomic factors, and physical, and fa physical um, factors. So before we go into government structure, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a feel for Roanoke City Allegheny Health Districts. If we look at Roanoke City Allegheny Health Districts, and we're going to flip this chart at some point, but the higher you are, the worse off you are, right? You don't want to be ranked 133 out of 133. That's bad. Um, so Covington, the, 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 the jurisdictions that we serve in our health district are Roanoke City, then the Allegheny Health District, which is Allegheny County, um, Botetot County, Covington City, Craig County, um, Roanoke County, and Salem City. 
and this is how they're ranked. Now, you guys don't serve Covington and Allegheny. That's, Car Carillion doesn't go up that far. We get yeah. plenty of patients. Yeah. You get plenty, so they're probably referred down here. Um, it's not theoretically in the Carillion catchment area, but it's probably a referral system. It's in the catchment area, but we don't have a facility there. But we have family medicine uh, providers in Covington. Yeah. I did not know that. Um, so, so Covington is our poorest city. It's it's about um, 5,000 population. Then uh, Roanoke City urban centers are typically going to be worse off with respect to health outcomes. And then you can see Badatat is our healthiest city. Um, and you can imagine why, right? So why do you, what, what do you think are the greatest drivers of health in, in those communities, Covington and um, Badatat? Personal income. Sorry? Personal income. Income. Tax base. Tax base, absolutely. So the two greatest drivers are income and education, and because of the way we structure our education, income usually drives education, right? Our public school system is very dependent on the tax base. So if we look at, specifically now we're gonna, if we look at children, your, your focus area, um, you can now see the correlation. Covington has the most children living in poverty, the greatest percentage of children living in poverty, followed by Roanoke City, and they fall in, you know, they, they fall very similarly to the, the county health rankings. So poverty being, from a literature perspective, education is the biggest driver of good health or poor health. But in our country, it's that's very driven by income. Does that make sense? Okay. So now um, we're going to get back. So that's just to give you a flavor of of where we are. Um, now to get back to, okay, well, does government fix poverty? Different people will, will argue whether government should have a place in fixing poverty. Um, but what is the public health system? If, we're, if our job is to assure all of those conditions, which is a tall order and we can't, we can't do all of that, what is the structure in which we try to do that? So um, there is no single public health agency. When, you, when I say public health agency, what immediately comes to mind? CDC, right? That's that's like what everybody thinks about. Um, but there's a lot more to the public health system than the Centers for Disease Control. We'll see where the Centers for Disease Control fits in just a second. But no single agency has has authority or accountability, um, and there's an unbelievably complex public health system. So I'm sure you guys all know this, but just in case, three branches of government. Legislative, so there are some federal laws, right? What's a federal health law that you can think about? Yeah, well, their laws. What's that? The laws. Of, sorry. No. I, I mean, so there there are some federal laws with respect to health, not necessarily public health. We'll get to that. Any any what laws do you have to follow? HIPAA. Just throwing it down there, right? Like that's a federal law. You have to follow it. ACA, the Affordable Care Act, federal law influences a lot of the way we practice, right? Um, but the executive branch is where public health really falls. Um, and then, of course, the judicial branch, we, we, we all know what happened in, in June with respect to the way it changes health, access to health, or, or how it can. Um, so if we think about public health specifically, at the federal level, there is nothing in the U.S. Constitution that addresses health. What does address health indirectly, like with HIPAA, is um, interstate commerce. And so that's th th there are some aspects of the U.S. Constitution that influence health, but, but there's, not, there's not a lot. Um, what the federal government does with respect to public health is it provides goal setting. So healthy people 3030, healthy people 2020, healthy people, have you guys heard of healthy people? Yeah, so it sets goals, um, national benchmarks for where we need to be. It provides guidance. So Centers for Disease Control just changed their infection control guidance around COVID-19, saying that healthcare providers in settings like this don't have to wear masks. That just came out um, as long as we're not near patients, right? Um, 
That doesn't mean you can necessarily take them off because Karelian organizational policy trumps federal policy. Um, just saying. Um, it will be interesting to see if Karelian follows suit. VDH followed suit right away. Um, and then funding. So a huge thing for the federal government with respect to public health is funding. So we get funding, um, Title V funding, Title X funding, all sorts of funding. Um, executive branches. So with respect to pediatrics, the WIC program is under the executive branch of the USDA. Um, early intervention is under the Department of Education. Now, clearly, the Department of Health and Human Services is overwhelmingly where you are influenced by federal policy, not necessarily law, but policy, through Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. So the biggest influence on the way you practice is Centers for Medicare or Medicaid, lead screening required by Medicaid, right? Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, with public health, we have a whole bunch of agencies under HHS for public health. So we talked about CDC. What are some other agencies that you think about with respect to public health? Pay attention to time here. Any other agencies? NIH. NIH, absolutely. So a lot of our research comes through NIH, of course. And it funds a ton of a ton of public health work, as well as healthcare delivery work, healthcare work. Anything else that you can think of? DOD. The Department of Defense. Um, so I'm thinking within HHS. But yeah, DOD has some has some policies that definitely influence us. Absolutely. Um, that's a long story. I'll, if you're interested, we can talk offline about the disconnect between some DOD policies and CDC policies around emerging infectious diseases. Because DOD has incredible influence over work in emerging infectious diseases. A lot of people don't necessarily know that. Um, <coughs> so within Health and Human Services, there's AHRQ, which definitely influences healthcare. So, healthcare quality, uh, re research and quality. Um, some of these you, you probably won't won't think about, but FDA and HRSA. So HRSA funds a lot of work, particularly around underserved communities. Um, and these are these are other SAMSHAs in there as well. So these are all branches within HHS. Okay, so government structure, federal government. The reality is that almost everything that we think about from a public health policy perspective happens at the level of the state. And so why did some, this is the question that I get asked the most, why was it possible for Florida have, to have these rules? Florida, we were just talking about this yesterday, Florida's Surgeon General releasing a statement against young men getting vaccinated for COVID-19. Really? God. Because of the risk of cardiomyopathy. <sighs> yeah, right? I mean, we're all gasping. Like, how is that even possible? How is it possible that states are that different? Well, the reason that it's possible is the way our Constitution is written, almost all authority is at the level of the state. That's also what happened in June. Right, that, that yeah, and this is super, 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 super simplified. But at the end of the day, the reality is that most authority lies at the level of the state. So where you practice matters incredibly. Um, and that's one of the things that we try to make sure our students know, that when you're applying to residency, you might want to make sure that you know about what the policies are in that state. Because you don't want to, let's say you're going into hematology, oncology, pediatric palliative care. Well, not that's not true. Not for pediatrics. <laughs> that would not be true. But if you're an adult trying to go into hemonc and um, living in a state that has medical aid and dying, that might be very, very important to you. Um, that's not going to be true for children. We're never going to have that for children. For children. Um, but at the end of the day, the reality is that we have police power at the level of the state. And this gets back to assuring the conditions in which we can be healthy. So the state has authority to say, 
I'm going to make sure your water is safe. So if you want to build a house, I, I, the state, am delegating the local authority to go and make sure that your well is safe, just, just on inspection. Um, that's a police authority. We're going to make sure that your septic system is built far away from your well. We're going to require that we, because we have the police authority to assure health. Um, so this gets back to the power of the law to protect those conditions. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and really what happens is that the state, which has all of this power, delegates its power to the locality. And so now we've gone from the federal government to the state government to the local government. And in Virginia, these are our health districts, and this is our district. So we, we serve this area. And now I'm going to go into what do we do? How do we try to work to assure the conditions in which you can, we can be healthy with an emphasis specifically on children for obvious reasons? So any comments or questions from? Okay. Um, any comments or questions from you guys before we go into local? Okay. So this is our, this is an organizational chart for our health department. And we're, I'm, I'm, so we have an administrative branch, our clinical services, emergency preparedness, environmental health, epidemiology, family services, population health, vital records, and women's and infants and children, our WIC program. Um, this to me is not a logical way of organizing a health department, but this is the structure that the state provides that we must follow. So for me, I don't really understand how family services and population health are separate from clinical services, but this is, this is the structure in which I live. So this is the structure that I will share with you. So I'm not gonna cover everything. We're not gonna go over administration or vital records because that's not important for you as practicing um, physicians, but if you have any questions about those, you can let me, you know, you can ask them afterwards. So clinical services. Well, first of all, do you guys know what clinical services we provide? I've got the list right there. Ignore the list. <laughs> Don't look at the list. <laughs> TB management. TB management. Yeah, so we want to be responsible for TB management because what we are, what we are trained to do, what we are experts in is case investigations and contact tracing, right? So with TB, we want to do the three circles, you know, go out to the extent possible. And we want to make sure that no one who has active TB poses a threat to the public's health. So we will do directly observed therapy on 100% of our patients who have active TB. So TB management. Refugee, refugee. refugee and newcomer health. So anyone who comes into, the, into our community will get screened through the health department, will have a comprehensive review of immunizations and TB status. Um, we don't have a great system here yet to refer people into primary care afterwards. I'm hoping that um, we get there, maybe with, through Carillion. Um, that's what we had in the health department that I, I worked in um, in my prior life, but we don't have that established yet. Okay, so, so TB, newcomer health, I was going to ask about adoptions from outside of the United States. That doesn't have any place for the health branch, just the refugees. No, it's mm -hmm. it's strictly refugees. So we don't, um, so legal people who are legally coming under um, du duress, really. I mean, that by definition, if you're a refugee, we do not do anything with respect to adoption or immigration. Mm -hmm. How about flu vaccines? Do you guys? Vaccinations, vaccinations, vaccinations. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we are the vaccination hub. <laughs> I mean, for, for underserved or marginalized communities to the extent possible. And back to school, because a lot of families may have trouble getting somewhere, so we bring vaccine to them. Travel, travel clinic. We actually don't do travel. Um, some, like if you go to No River Valley, and this is one of the things that's really interesting to me, we're a centralized health, public health system here, so every state is a little bit different. Here, everybody who works in public health, in governmental public health, is a state employee, not a local employee. Um, and 
you would think that because we're all state, we would have the same services everywhere you go, but that's not true. Um, so New River Valley has a travel clinic, but we do not. We do EI. We're, we're one of three districts that does EI. Other districts, EI is done by the Community Service Board. Um, so it's very variable, which is another thing. We'll, we'll see if we can keep working on it. Um, but the other things that probably aren't going to impact your, your populations as much, um, well, we do family planning, so any, you know, any uh, teenager that you have who may feel concerned about coming to a place that their parents know they come to, feel free to refer them to us. We can provide family planning services. <coughs> Immunization, so, and, and these are services provided, just some numbers from 2021. Immunization services, new, and this is ex excluding, so over 6,000 immunizations, excluding COVID, obviously. Um, newcomer health, we served over 120 clients, um, and here's the distribution. So Afghanistan is our greatest pop, uh, country represented in our newcomer health. Um, STIs. Again, we can certainly see your your patients if they feel like they want a place that has a little bit more anonymity. Um, <coughs> and then TV, which, which we talked about. <coughs> Emergency preparedness. People rely on their local health departments to um, support them in a crisis. And so we have an emergency preparedness team. We did not do 345,000 vaccines. Our community did 345,000 vaccines. But we facilitate that. So we still are, we still get the list of vaccine requirement, of vaccine requests. So if Corellian, in the beginning, when Corellian wanted vaccine, I needed to approve it. Like I myself needed to approve it when it was really tightly controlled. Um, now, after a few months, they, so in the very beginning, like with, when the pediatric vaccine was released, we had to approve where it was being distributed within our communities, but then very shortly, once it becomes available, then the healthcare delivery systems were allowed to order it themselves. Um, but that was with a critical resource, we control those resources in the beginning. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, Environmental health, just some numbers. I know you can't see this, but we do food protection, lead program, on-site sewer drinking well, rabies. We're going to look at a, a, a thing about that in just a minute. Um, swimming pools. That says recreational waste. That should be recreational water. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> pools, swimming pools, and we do hotels and motels. So we, so go, any mobile event like GoFest, we're going to be out there inspecting <laughs> that, that it's safe. Um, rabies, so we do rabies case management. If you feel that there is a, a child, you're going to send them to the ED, I'm assuming. Um, we, we don't do that usually outside of the ED. <coughs> they're going to get their rig, they're going to get their first post-exposure prophylaxis. We'll then do case management to make sure that they complete their series. Um, and we'll facilitate getting them vaccine if, um, if, there's, a, if there's a barrier to them getting vaccine. Um, just so, so here are some numbers. Um, number uh, that tested positive. So raccoons were our number one testing positive. A couple weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago or so, I don't know if any of you were involved in this, there was a three-year-old who was, there were some children getting put in their car seats and the three-year-old was standing and a fox grabbed the child and pulled it out of the car. Yeah. Um, and within, you know, I mean, as soon as we got that, Call, we approve post-exposure prophylaxis. Normally, if we have that, the, the fox was there, we get the head, we test the head. But in a situation like that, we're going to authorize PEP right away because there's no situation in which that's not going to be positive, right? That's not that's not realistic. So, in that case, we start we started the PEP right away. In general, if we have the animal, we're not going to start PEP until after we get the results back. And that's one of the areas where we frequently find that physicians over-prescribe rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, there are lots of reasons why there's no reason to do rabies post-exposure prophylaxis. <coughs> if we have the animal, we either observe it or if it's sick, it's, it's euthanized and we test it. Um, 
if the animal is a known animal, even if it's a feral cat, if this is a feral cat that comes and gets fed every day, it's not really a feral cat. If we can visualize that cat on day 10, we don't need to do post-exposure prophylaxis because if it was rabid at the time it fit, it would be dead, 100%. So, just, yes. So when you, when you made this comment about the fox, that it's going to be positive, I didn't quite understand what you were saying. It's because that behavior was so abnormal. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so in general, there are certain, like, there are certain behaviors that are so abnormal that the pretest probability is basically 100%. So when, and that's why a phone call to us, we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, we've got the experts on, on the other side of the phone and we'll talk through it and we'll say, yeah, this is a situation, go ahead and start the PEP or no, this, let's, we'll, you know, this, let's, let's wait for, we, we've got 10 days, let's wait 10 days to two weeks. And we do have a vet available to us if we need it, but most of our team are so, so fluent in this language that we're, that, that we can answer it. If you have the animal head, how long does it take to get your information back? Um, so once we will get results within 48 to 72 hours. 72 hours would be if it's a Friday. Generally, we get it within 48 hours. So well within the 10-day period, two-week period. We have up to two weeks um, because of the incubation period. Uh, we, you know, generally we have even longer than that, but we want to make sure we have a definitive answer, usually by day 10. Does that, yeah. I hope I'm not asking an abrasive question. It's a little bit tangent from past experience. An animal, like a fox, raccoon, something that, that, that might be, if it's not, if it's abnormally acting, yet doesn't do something like that, what, are, are they routinely tested at this point or, or, or not? I, call, I, find, I find an abnormal animal and they're acting, are they all tested? Do we have any idea what the incidence of rabies among some of these animals is? Um, <clears throat> it's still really rare. So I will, I will tell you that, that it really depends on the situation. So animal control makes the decisions about whether they're going to kill the animal or not. We don't make that decision. Um, if they catch the animal. I will tell you that generally if they get a report that there is an abnormally behaving animal, they're going to try to get it and kill it. That's just, they're not going to take that risk. Um, but from a, from a public health perspective, I really don't care if you call me and say there's a, a fox acting abnormally in your backyard if there's no human exposure. I just care if there's a human exposure. Does, does that make sense? I mean, I would hope that it wouldn't go to someone else's yard and bite someone. No, it doesn't do that. Um, okay. And, but it's still really rare. Um, so environmental health, epidemiology. And this is where I really want to make sure, this is probably the most, not, not probably, just keep checking my, my time. This is the most important place where we intersect. Because if you don't, I'm going to say, talk about being a little bit of race. <laughs> Like that wasn't abrasive at all. If you don't do your job, you are denying me the opportunity to do my job if you don't report reportable diseases. It's that easy. Um, and so by law, all of you are required to report reportable diseases to us. If, if you, you can just VDH, reportable diseases, and there's a list. And there's a list that includes the left hand, which is red, which means you need to call us. This is not something, in general, the labs are going to report, right? We have systems where the labs report positives, and that's great, and that system works. It, it alleviates your responsibility. At the end of the day, it's still your responsibility. So you need to make sure that you're working in a healthcare system that has that appropriate lab. But there are situations where even suspicion of disease is reportable. So we're not going to have a lab for that, right? Because there's going to be a delay. So what are some examples in which you really need to pick up the, call, the phone and call me? Or call one of us. Or have your infection control person call us? 
So monkeypox absolutely was it what is an ongoing example. So sometimes we get people <coughs> after the fact that a test has been done. You are required by law to report it when you suspect it, not when it turns positive. Because what's happened in that meantime? Spreading. That person is out there potentially exposing other people. So monkeypox, call us if you suspect it. The minute you start thinking about it, call us. We'll, we'll work with you. What's another? TB. TB, 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 TB. <laughs> so I've been, I've been in this position for about two years, and I'm going to, I'm, there have been three separate situations where we have found out six weeks after the fact that TB was suspected. And we found out when it culture positive. Well, oh. TB can take six weeks to culture positive, right? So, and in one situation, there were four missed opportunities where the clinicians involved suspected TB and did not notify us. By the time we found out, three children had converted. Now, we don't know whether they would have converted anyway. It is certainly because of the indolence of, of active TB. By the time we find it, people have been, you know, had it for months typically. But we don't know because we weren't involved. And that is our job. It is our job to do the contact tracing, to do the TSTs or the, uh, or the, the, the interferons, um, the quantiferons. Um, but we can't do our job if we don't know, right? So TB, monkeypox, what are some other diseases? What's that? Something unusual, like Ebola or death yeah, or something. Yeah, definitely. So, so we have a little Ebola outbreak going on in Uganda right now, which has changed our policies. All people coming from Uganda now have to go to one of five airports in the United States um, so that they can get screened appropriately. So, so yes, definitely if there was Ebola, absolutely. So any really unusual, give us a call. Neisseria meningitis. Neisseria meningitis, right? So in the ideal world, someone comes in, a child is suspected of having it, and they might get their IV antibiotics before even the, the, the CSF is, is obtained. The CSF may be negative, right? But your clinical suspicion is still high. We need to know because maybe that child was in daycare. And if that child was in daycare, we need to get everybody at that daycare involved, no, we need to notify the parents, and we need to make sure that we offer post-exposure prophylaxis, right? So, so that's a, and we had a situation um, where this was not in a child, but we had a situation where the providers called us right away. This was an individual who was unhoused. Based on clinical suspicion, um, we were able to work with Fralin Free Clinic to get post-exposure prophylaxis to everybody. The person was unhoused but, but was residing in a homeless shelter. Get everybody who the person had direct contact with, respiratory um, secretions contact with, post-exposure prophylaxis. We got the PCR results six days later that showed that it was Neisseria. If we had waited for the PCR results, we would have lost our window, right? Um, so that was a perfect example of the clinician notifying us right away, us getting our relationships into place to get everybody who needed to get prophylaxis, the, the care. You're going to think about the family, right? But we need to think about everybody else. Um, so that's, that's, that's a, a great example. Um, those are the big ones. But... If you don't remember anything else, <laughs> remember that I can't do my job if you're not doing yours. And it's, it's a lot. So um, I will tell you that, that while we have the ability to penalize systems or individuals, we would never do that. We would take the education route. And in this situation with the TB and the failure of reporting with TB, there were different healthcare institutions involved, and we've done education with all of them. Um, <laughs> So that's just, you know, that's reportable diseases. Please let us know. And the whole point is so that we can assure the conditions in which people can be helped. Yes? Well, that's an interesting comment about suspicion. Because we, 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 in medicine, we have a differential diagnosis. <laughs> Sometimes TBs on your differential, but it's way down here. And so at what point do we bring you in? Uh, we would much rather... <coughs> 
get the phone call and talk through it and agree that this isn't a high index of suspicion, then vice versa. So we, there is no one on our staff who will ever be upset for getting a phone call. And I'm not kidding, like this is, this is Dr. Bafalbani and I j joke about this all the time because it is always a Friday, a weekend, <laughs> or one of the two of us is on vacation. It just, it happens all the time. But we don't, you know, we would so much rather get that call than not get that call. Um, now, if it's really, really low on your differential, you're just, you know, yeah. using it. It's, it's, if it's a realistic suspicion and you're worried, I think that would be, if you're worried, give us a call. Don't lose sleep over it. Just give us a call and we'll, we'll talk through it. So there was another situation where there was a, a, a suspicion of potential meningitis. I ended up talking with pediatric ID. Neither of us felt like this was on Thanksgiving. Neither one of us felt that it was a high index of suspicion. We opted not to pull the trigger in terms of notifying the daycare. It ended up Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, and we're not always going to be right, but the more of us that brainstorm it together, we're more likely to get to where we need to go. Does that, does that make sense? Um, and the other thing, infant bot, um, if you suspect infant bot, call us because you have to call us to get the antitoxin. And if you if, if you don't go that route, all you're doing is delaying treatment. Um, so that would be an instant call to us. We're gonna we're gonna um, get CDC involved. Literally, someone at CDC has the bot pager. We're gonna get them involved. And if we think that it's a high index of suspicion, there's no rule out. Like you either suspect it or you don't. <laughs> Um, and if you feel like you need antitox, you are obligated to do the whole testing. But we'll walk you through that. CDC will walk us together through that. You're talking about botulism, right? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Yes, botulism, infant botulism. Um, so that, that's sort of the, 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 the most important stuff that I wanted to talk about. And we're going to finish finish this up. but. Um, just briefly, I'm sure everybody heard about the famous Anthony's hepatitis A outbreak. It made the news. I want to just say what's happened since then. So that was a year ago, September. We had 51 cases. Um, hepatitis A, if you have a case of hepatitis A, ask what their job is. If they're 14 and they're working at Wendy's, we need to know that, right? We, we need to know what the occupation, anyone has hepatitis A, first thing, well, maybe not the first thing, but one of the first things you should ask is whether they're working. Even if they're a child, they, they, might, they might be working. Um, so this was a food handler who had bare hand contact and retrospect learned he had bare hand contact with foods. We had 51 primary and secondary cases, three fatalities, one liver transplant. It then led to community spread. And since then, we've had an additional 97 cases in our community, almost exclusively in the population of individuals who use injection drugs. Um, and because of the overlap, it's a Venn diagram, not trying to, to have biases or prejudice here, but the reality is that food handlers, generally speaking, are the occupation that's at greatest risk for a substance use disorder. Um, and you can imagine social determinants of health, why that is. Um, we've had three other food handlers who have substance use disorder who were identified with hepatitis A. Um, none of them resulted in transmission in, in, the food, in the food establishment, but in each case, we had to go through this whole cycle. Um, just our outbreak. Societal costs, anyone who's interested in this, I have all of the references for where these, these numbers came from. Um, in addition to the human toll, it has cost society over $3 million because one person didn't wash their hands when they had hepatitis A. So moving from communicable diseases, that is what we are known for, right? Assuring the conditions in which people can be healthy, control of communicable diseases. But with respect to what you guys do, just want to make sure that you know that we provide baby care. Baby care is home visitation services. 
In the Roanoke Valley, we strongly suggest that if you have families who are Medicaid eligible, that you use CHIP, because CHIP provides far more comprehensive services than we do. It would be a disservice to your patients to refer them to baby care when they could be eligible for CHIP, because CHIP is more comprehensive. End of story, they have more services to offer. But if you have a patient in Bonitat, if, if it's outside of the CHIP catchment area, feel free to contact us. Covington, feel free to contact us, and we can provide baby care services. Um, early intervention, we're going to see a slide on early intervention in just a minute. And both lead and rabies case management. So we will, if we just found out that there was a child with a lead level of 27, we talked about a child back in November or December who had a lead level of um, 45 in Covington. We will provide case management services until that child's um, lead normalizes, and we can link them up to community services to get remediation for their home. Um, so let us know, and we'll, we'll help take care of that family. Early intervention, I said I would go back to this. Um, we, not all health departments, I mentioned this, provide early intervention services. We do. We, we own early intervention in, in our districts. It just depends on what district you live in, whether it's the CSB, the Community Service Board, or the Health Department. Um, and on a monthly basis, we'll have about 260 children enrolled. Um, of those, most are going to be receiving speech therapy, um, some physical therapy, some vision. 20, occupational developmental services. So this is just the breakdown of what we see on average every month, what we're coordinating on average every month. Um, population health, the biggest thing with population health with respect to pediatrics is if you have a, a family where mom is pregnant and you're seeing the other children um, and there's a, a concern whether they have access to car seats, call us. We work with Carillion um, Community Outreach, but we can make sure that they get the car seats that they need for their for their families. Um, and then, of course, women's infants, children. I'm assuming everybody here is very well aware of women's and infants, children. We run infants uh, the WIC program here, um, and we strongly, strongly encourage. This, these are our monthly averages. We strongly encourage everybody who's eligible for WIC services to get them because we know that they work. The return on investment is well is well investigated, well researched. And we know that families that participate in WIC who are eligible have better outcomes than families that don't. Um, and so that is, I think I made it, right? Talked pretty quickly at the end there. Um, but I wanted to make sure that there was a little bit of time for questions. Um, so we hopefully defined how public health, hopefully you all feel comfortable with that. Overview of government structure. Um, I saw some people like, oh, that makes sense. Ho hopefully that this was enlightening in that way. And most importantly, hopefully now you have a better sense of what we do and how we partner with you, how the, the public health system and the healthcare delivery system partner to improve the health of the children that we mutually serve. Um, so with that, any any questions online? I feel we're not seeing them. Okay, wake up, people online. <laughs> any questions that I didn't answer? Already? So just from a really, really practical point of view, um, I know that docs will be busy and not report things a lot. It, it happens. Especially if your suspicion is low, it's not a big deal. Sometimes when it's moderate, it is more of a big deal. Is there any kind of reimbursable, like, Medicare or, I mean, Medi Medicaid that where you, you contacted public health and that's part of your billing or anything like that? No. No, it's just an, uh, an unfunded mandate. <laughs> but it is part of patient care, so I think it fit. But no, there's not a separate billing code for contacting. As, as far as I'm aware, there's no separate billing code for contacting the health department. Trying to motivate people. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can motivate them by saying that if they don't, there could be a thirty-five thousand dollar fine and a license issue. If, if it's a if visit on hand, then it's part of that visit. I mean, it is part of. It's yeah. It's part. So it's, it when should you, be. When you generate your EMA, you know, code for that, it would be part of that. But there's no separate. No. 
We need Dr. We need Dr. Lockyer in here. She's our expert. Yeah, and I, I'm not aware of a separate billing code. It would be considered part of the comprehensive. Yeah, so it could be up here. I could be wrong, but I don't. I think you're right. But yeah, the, the, it, it's much more of a stick than a carrot. <laughs> so this is more of a philosophical question, but I think about this all the time. When you when you started your conversation, you talked about um, poverty and you talked about social determinants of health. Um, and as a you know an older person now, I, I'm I've just seen that the the family structure dissolve, and no one talks about that. Yet that is probably the biggest impact on the health and welfare of our children. And I'm not sure how to talk about, how to even address that, but it weighs, weighs on me when I see patients. Yeah, so in, in general, um, the individual factors, social determinants of health are really, really limited. It's going to be genotype, right? It's very, very limited. I think that, that you're right that the majority of influence is this sphere. It's the interpersonal sphere. And one of the things that I like to, when, when I'm talking to students is I like to make sure that they realize that they're part of that sphere with their patients. So they are, physicians are in the sphere of influence, in this interpersonal sphere of influence. You're absolutely right. I don't know how we can quantify that. So I can, we have lots of studies that quantify the impact of income, education, those are the two clearest ones. Everything else is a bit is, is, is a bit more challenging because how do you measure cohesion? But there is a lot more literature now looking at social cohesion as an independent risk factor, not necessarily at the family level, but at the neighborhood level. So, so communities, even if they are communities living uh, communities of poverty, if there is strong societal cohesion, if there are neighbors that can know that they can go over and ask their, their next door neighbor to, to babysit their, their child while they go to the grocery store, those communities have better outcomes than the communities of low social cohesion. I, I'm not aware, but I don't know if you're aware of studies that specifically look at family cohesion, other than that we know, like the, the the risk, the, the risk factors and the protective factors, that the family, we have good, relatively good um, information about the families that eat together are better off than the families that don't. Um, so I, you're, you're right, I kind of glossed over that because I wanted to focus on the services and the intersectionality, but you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that the importance when we talk about social determinants of health, realizing that this is the most influential sphere. This sphere is then influenced by these other spheres. So a family that, that is living in a community where there aren't a lot of jobs and mom and dad have to work two different jobs at different times, they're not likely to be able to eat together as a family. Right, so, so they, they're, all, they're all influenced, but this is, a, you're, it's critical, it's critical. Any ideas for what we can do differently? <laughs> it's a huge societal change, but I guess what you know, it used to be a stigma, but now we're we're seeing a lot of cohabitation and lack of commitment. Even it, it I see it, very educated people. We, I don't want to get too far into this, but it, it's it's really just. It, it seems like our we see pets having better um, care than children. <laughs> so, I mean, it is sad, uh, but our society has devalued children and family, I think, in a lot well, of Well, I think just that the statistics on children living in poverty is the proof of that, right? Yeah. Like, that, that we live in a society in which so many children, we're at 830, so um, that so many children live in poverty. The one thing that I would say, what we know, where we have unbelievably good evidence, and Virginia is a little bit... It's not resourced. The public health system is not resourced to address this. But the home visitation um, programs, like so, so where I came from, we had nurse family partnership. In New York, there's a nine to one return on investment or one to nine return on investment 
for a nurse family partnership. Um, and a lot of that is exactly what you're talking about, is that the long-term outcomes are improved family dynamics within the families that have the, those home visitation services. And so I would say that if you aren't utilizing CHIP or other home visitation services for your families at greatest risk for social lack of cohesion, that is a tool where people can come into the house, become a, a trusted support system and build support within the family unit. So I'd strongly recommend home visitation services, the right home visitation <laughs> services for at-risk families. We'll probably have time, but a quick question. This will just and be, I, this will egg this Dr. Today. Keys on, but I really like your word cohesion because it's not only, I mean, he's talking about the home environment and what that is or isn't nowadays. Um, you, know, you know, do you sit down for a meal ever? Um, what is your social network? So if people are like getting mobile phone, but that's so often, you know, and it's just not a cohesion. Yeah. It's more of a dispersion. It's going to be so interesting to see the long-term outcomes of the things we're all addicted to. <laughs> little things that dictate our lives. All right. Well, I'm happy to stay. I know you guys. I'm very happy to stay and ask, you know, answer any questions that. Thank you so Thank much. You. You're welcome.